Well, welcome. And if I could have uh, you guys switch over. Yeah, hopefully that'll work. Awesome. Um, the slides aren't going to be too fancy tonight. It's just going to be some passages of scripture. And I thought what we would do as we go through tonight, um, I'm going to try to incorporate kind of what we learned in inductive Bible study and kind of do that as we go through um, uh, this look at worship. And so tonight, basically what I've done is kind of a word study of like, what does the Bible say about worship? Basically, just starting at, not at Genesis, well, I mean, kind of at Genesis and all the way through. And we're just going to be highlighting that. And I thought, well, as we look at the verses, maybe what we can do is just practice, like, let's look at this verse and then let's make some observations and see what we can, can learn from it, you know? So that's kind of the idea. We'll see how far we can get. Um, so I'm going to put the verses on the, on the wall um, as we go along. Um, but I encourage you to follow along in your own Bible and take notes as we go and that kind of thing. We are going to probably be making some summary kind of statements and stuff about worship. And, um, and then next week we'll do another session on worship. I'm not exactly sure uh, what, how I'm going to approach that one, but uh, I have a fe- funny feeling we're not going to get through everything that I have for tonight. So it'll be uh, session two, I guess, or whatever. So, so anyway... Uh, worship. Um, and let's pray. Lord, we just want to look at this part of our, our life, this way that you've created us to worship, to worship you, and who you are, and how that's supposed to look in our life, Lord. And I just pray that as we go through your word, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit, and, um, and help us, help us to move past where we are, if there's areas of our life that aren't pleasing to you, that we would repent and change. And if there's areas of our life that maybe there's a small spark, that you would just fan it into flame even more. And for those that are just worshiping you, that they would just be encouraged and built up to continue. And so, Lord, we ask for your help tonight in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, worship is a, it's really a primary component of our relationship. And I think, you know, as we were talking with John at the table um, at the beginning of the, the session here tonight, um, you know, he was talking about how, you know, he became a Christian. He was coming out of drugs and, uh, you know, a totally different lifestyle. And the songs that they were playing at church were really different from maybe the songs that he was listening to. And that's why we thought they were hokey or whatever. But there comes that point where it's like, you know what, the words of this song, it's resonating with how I feel about the Lord and, and how I think about him. And, uh, and worship, as, as John was describing, starts to become like, this is about my relationship with the Lord. This isn't about, you know, I come to church and some guy or girl or a team of people get up and they try to sing songs and I kind of muddle along or whatever. Worship is really an integral part of how we relate to the Lord. And uh, I don't know if you've ever thought of this before, but everybody worships something. Think about that for a second. Everybody worships something. And I think in God's heart, he created us that I don't like we just there has to be something in our life that's kind of what our life is about what we are what we focus our attention on I remember Pastor Chuck um, at Calvary Costa Mesa he used to say that that really God or people a God in someone's life is that master passion that thing that just captures someone's imagination and attention that thing in their life that is kind of all-encompassing and the true and living God wants to be that master passion that's the rightful place for him but when we set God aside and allow something else to be that master passion in our life it brings such destruction not only for ourselves but the people around us doesn't it I mean I think if you ask John uh, his testimony of how destructive w- what his life was like before he knew Christ and how it not only hurt him, but it hurt his family and the people around him, 
right? And not, not I mean, that's not a solo story, right? That's all of our story, right? Um, and so God, when he created us, he has a plan for us to worship that, like, well, think about it for a second. Let's, let's go to um, even the Ten Commandments. What are the first two commandments about? It's about God and, and how we view God, how we relate to God. I have them up there on the, the wall. Um, it comes from Exodus 20. There's other passages that, that review the Ten Commandments, but just the first two, you shall have no God before me. And then the second one, you shall not make any image to worship, any, anything to worship anything else besides me. God wants our exclusive, like he wants the exclusive with us, right? <laughs> like, hey, worship in your life, that's me. That, that's our relationship. No one gets in the middle of that. No one takes away from that. It's just me and you. I created you to know me, and, and I created to have fellowship with you, and, and I want to have that place in your life, and don't mix anything else in there. Now, the history of humanity is a really sorry, sad story of men and women not knowing and loving their creator, right? Think about it for a second. I mean, how my, my kids uh, do history at home. We, we're homeschooling our kids, so I hear all these things about history, and it's like, oh, God, well, they failed. <laughs> that, that country, that, that leader. <laughs> I mean, it, almost any historical sequence of events is really a story of, of human failure, of not following the Lord. I mean, it's very few and far between where you're like, oh, awesome. That person actually loved God and did what was right. Um, man's history is, is just plagued with failure, and it really comes from, I think, a root of this issue of what's the master passion of my life, and what do I worship? What am I living for? So let's look at some of these, um, these examples of human failure. Um, this will be the sad part of the Bible study, <laughs> our sad predicament that... Uh, and we can't, I don't think we can pick up stones and say, man, those guys, those people in that verse. I mean, we should just hit ourselves with a rock and go, that's me, man. I'm the same knucklehead that that guy was. Okay, let's take a look at some of these. In Isaiah 46, uh, Isaiah is a prophet, and he's, he's kind of speaking the word uh, from, of the Lord or speaking um, the, the words that the Lord's given to him. And this is what God says through Isaiah. He says, They lavish gold out of the bag. They weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. They bear on the shoulder. They carry it and set it in its place, and it stands from its place. It shall not move. The one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. Now, you have many maybe friends or, or acquaintances, family in your life, that they're not living for the God of the Bible. And you see what they live for, and they give their money and their energy to that, and then when times get hard, does that thing help them? No. It just takes, and it keeps taking. And in this, this example, he's has the example of that person that would make kind of take the gold melt have the guy melt it down make it into an image but it's like if I want my God to come with me guess what I got to pick him up and take him and if he falls over guess what I got to pick him back up and put him right and if things go wrong in my life he's just going to sit there with the eyes that were molded in his head that can't see anything or hear anything and yet humans do that right now we may not make like a little tiki idol thing or whatever but we have things that we live for things that we oh if i could just have this or do this it would fix me or i would be happy 
You know, we go to Africa. They make little, like, mud creations that they offer to you. And, you know, when we share the gospel with them, not, not me personally, but when the teams go and they share with them, many of them say, I know this isn't a God, but this is all I know. And then they hear the true God of the Bible, and they respond because they want to know the right person to worship. But this is, all, this is all they knew, and this is what they created and what they did. Let's look at another one, Jeremiah. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, in this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like the sash which is unprofitable for nothing. Now he goes on and talks about the sash, but I just wanted to look at this idea here of those people that refuse to hear God, and they want to do their own thing. They follow the dictates of their own heart, it says, and they walk after other gods and serve and worship them. It's so sad, and yet there's something about our human hearts that that's what we tend to do. I mean, I think if we went around the room, we could all say, yeah, you know what? I just remember I was a Christian, and, and I just started getting interested in this thing, and I just started to fall away, and then the Lord got a hold of me, and I came back, you know? I mean, any of you guys have that story? Yeah. I mean, maybe yesterday, or maybe earlier today, or maybe last week. Or, I mean, our heart is so easy to walk away from the Lord and to get intrigued by something else. And so you know, it's interesting how idolatry and worship, there's a relationship in that who are you worshiping? You're, worship, you're going to worship something. And you need to be careful about what it is that's in your heart or what, what, you, what you're after. Uh, let's look at another, Deuteronomy. Okay, this, this is the, the bad news section of the study, so, hey, so hang with me. Okay, it gets, there's better stuff, so this is the bad news, because then the good news is better. Cool? All right, Deuteronomy 12. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall uh, be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you to possess. So God's given him a land. All the days that you live on the earth, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you will dispossess served their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and every green tree or under every green tree and this is what god's instruction was to the people you shall destroy their altars break their sacred pillars and burn their wooden images with fire you shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place you shall not worship the lord your god with such things and so God was preparing them. He was, I'm going to give you a land. You're going to go in there, but they're going to have all these gods and all these different ways to worship these gods. And God said, you know what? You need to burn it all. You need to get rid of it. It needs to be completely gone because if it's not, you're going to go, huh, what is this? This is kind of interesting. It's going to start to, to draw your heart. And so God said, you got to get rid of that stuff. And you know, maybe for us, maybe there's things in our life, you know, there's kind of the Israelites going into the land is kind of analogous to our lives of God wants to get rid of the stuff that used to possess our life, if you will. You know what I mean? The old inhabitants. God wants us to get rid of that stuff. And I think we could take this verse really seriously of the stuff that was in my life. I need to, it needs to get burned and, and removed and out of here, broken down, because we're not going, we're not going to do what they did. We're not going to worship the way they worshiped. And then in Hebrews uh, 3, 7 through 10, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as they did in the rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And that is so true of us. Where do we go astray? We go astray in our heart, right? 
We start making decisions in our heart, and then we start, our life starts marching in that direction. But it starts in our heart. It starts with just a small desire, hmm, curiosity, and then exposure, and then interest, and then, you know, it doesn't take long. Like, how did I get here? How did that happen? It's like, well, I just went to this web page, and then I was looking at this, and I clicked here and there, and then, oh my gosh, now here I am. You know? We tend to go astray in our hearts, and I think um, it's so important for us to decide, like, Lord, you're my God, and there's no other gods before you, and I'm not going to worship any graven image. I'm not going to make a graven image. There's not going to be anything else in my life that I worship besides you. Um, I didn't put this one up, but I thought this one was interesting. Um, in Daniel 3, you guys remember Nebuchadnezzar, he kind of got this idea that he was like, going to be the god of the world. And um, it says, Then a herald, herald cried aloud. Not, his name wasn't Herald. He was a herald. Um, that was his job. And he said this, To you it's commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at that time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with any kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image of King Neg- ne- Nebuchadnezzar. Sorry, my tongue was all twisted. King Nebuchadnezzar has set up, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So you guys remember that story with the, the three Israelite uh, young men and uh, how they decided, you know what? Hey, man, you can play whatever music you want, but I'm not bound down to that big image. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds for us in, in our country or around the world, but there's, there's been times in history when leaders are like, look, this is the way it is. And if you don't bow down and worship the way we say, then you're toast. And these, these guys had to decide, what am I going to worship? How am I going to worship? What am I committed to? And they had to make a stand just for what their life was about, you know. And then Matthew 4 Remember when, uh, in fact, when we were doing inductive study, remember when Satan came to tempt Jesus? Remember we were looking at that passage. I think we were in Mark, but this is the same, um, same instance, but in, in Matthew's uh, gospel. And uh, it says this. It's, it's a different part of the story than what we were looking at in inductive, but um, you guys remember the setting. It says, again, the devil took him up on an ex, um, extendedly high mountain, or exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. So you're Satan coming to Jesus saying, you know what? I'll give you the whole world, man, if you worship me. Okay, look at Jesus' response. Away with you, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So I think we could kind of easily kind of make the observation that Satan really doesn't want us worshiping God, right? (laughs) He wants us to worship him or some variant, but anything but God. And so that's kind of, I don't know, like the bad news, I guess, or I don't know how you would necessarily put that, but um, that's the mistakes that humans make, right, in terms of worship. And I think if we were honest, we could say, you know, I've made that mistake. I've gone down that road, and, um, and I've fallen for that trap. But God doesn't want us to stay there, you know. He wants us to, to do things the right way. And so I wanted to, um, to look at some other verses. Let's look at John 4. Um, And John 4 is going to kind of come under this heading of worship is something that God wants from us or that God's seeking after, something that God sought after. Worship is sought after by God, I put there. Uh, John 4 in verse 19, I'll put that on the, on the board. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive, this is the woman at the well. You guys remember the woman at the well story? 
uh, the disciples are all hungry, so they're going to go down to McDonald's, and Jesus is there at the well. The lady's out at lunch, or, or uh, kind of late in the afternoon, getting water. Jesus kind of rolls up, starts having this conversation with her. So that's, that's the setting here. They didn't go to McDonald's, by the way. They, just, they were hungry. They were getting food. They went to town. So the lady says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And then this is the, the phrase that I wanted to emphasize. The Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I don't know if you've ever thought of that before, but God is looking. God is looking for worshipers. Maybe tonight in this room, you know, we're having a little like music worship session. God's looking around. He's looking for someone that's going to worship him in spirit and oh, there's one. Oh, thank you. There's one. Oh, he's looking. He's seeking for people to worship him. It pleases his heart. Um, we ha- my wife and I, we took our boys to the park. We were down at McKinley Park the other day, and uh, my wife wanted to show the boys something, something that was important to her, and uh, they had no interest. And uh, she was kind of hurt by that. And, and I... I don't know. I, I was thinking about how um, there's things that the Lord's interested in, and, but we can sometimes not take any interest in it. Like, hey, let's fellowship right now. Like, like I love you. How do you feel? Whatever. I hate this song. Or I'm tired. Or whatever. The coffee sucks tonight. Or you know, whatever. I mean, we have our minds totally somewhere else. We're interested in something different. And, um, and just the feeling of that, like, I mean, is God going to go cry or, you know, I don't know, but, but he's seeking those that would worship him. It's an invitation. It's, he's looking around. He's interested. And, and I just think, wait a second. You mean like, God is kind of looking around for someone that wants to worship him. Like, so like if I step forward and said, Lord, I want to worship you, like he would be into that? Like, yeah, totally would be. I don't know if you've ever, um, when we were at the park again, back to McKinley Park, um, all these junior hires had gotten out from school. There's like, I don't know, 15 junior hires cruising around. And um, man, you can just see those, those kids wanting the other kids to notice them or invite them to be a part of what they're doing or whatever. Just, there's this, you can almost, it's visible. <laughs> you can visibly see their hunger to be accepted and included and loved. And I just think, God's looking like, come on over. Like, I'm inviting you. If you're willing, right? The Lord's looking. I don't know if you've ever thought of that before, but it says that um, the Father is seeking such to worship him. What an awesome invitation. Now, that's true of, you know, when you drive home tonight. I mean, there's been many times when I just felt like the Lord said, hey, let's just talk. And I'm like, nah, let's flip on the radio or whatever. You know, like there's many times when the Lord gives us an invitation and and yet I can just, you know, just blow it off. And um, it's not good, right? I mean, what a great friend we have in Jesus. And yet we may not be the best friend. I mean, he wants to be our best friend, but Sometimes I'm not a very good friend, like the way I treat him, my attitude towards him, the way I respond to his, his invitations, you know. 
Um, but that's his heart. He's seeking. He's looking for those. He's interested. He's searching for those that would be wanting to worship him. And then let's turn. We're going to go to um, some examples of worship. Examples of worship. Because I think, you know, a picture paints a thousand words, right? And an example sometimes, especially a good example, can be, um, can kind of give it really clarity. Um, but sometimes it can be very challenging, you know? I think, um, I hate to pick on my boys uh, too much tonight, but I don't know. That's a big part of my life, of their life and watching how they live and stuff. And it's very, it's funny how sometimes my sons, they'll like, they'll try something for the first time, whatever, um, basketball or skating or just name any activity. And then they'll go, I'm, I'm pretty good at this, dad. I'm, I'm really good. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're pretty good. You know, for a first timer, <laughs> you're pretty good. And then, you know, you can see someone that's like so skilled or accomplished at something and you just go, oh my gosh. Like when I was a, when I was a, um, I don't know, I think it was in junior high school or whatever, my, my brother and I, we used to ride dirt bikes. And so we were out at this track and uh, I remember riding this Yamaha 125. I thought it was awesome. You know, I was like, eh, you know, I was going as fast as I could. I'm just thinking, I'm just pinning it, man. I'm just on fire. And there's this professional motocross guy that was out there practicing that day. He just flew by me so fast. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. I didn't even know that was possible. Right? And it just showed me, like, you think you're on fire. And then you, someone that's, like, on, really on fire, you go, oh, okay, I, I guess that's how it's done. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was my humble, humble pie story there. So anyway, going to these examples, you know, there may be times when we feel like, oh, I'm just so awesome at following the Lord. Or I'm so awesome at whatever. And then, you know, remember that story with the, the lady with the, the two, like, half pennies or whatever they were, like the, what, are they, what were those things called? Mites, yeah. And all the guys, hey, I'm giving a lot. Listen to me. Clink, clink, clink. Do, do, do. He just gave so much money. Awesome. The little, you know, numbers are, you know, rolling over on the wall, you know. Oh, wow. Look at how much he's giving, Jesus. That's awesome. He goes, you see that lady right there? She gave more than anybody else. Right? So we're going to look at some examples of people worshiping. In fact, that, that lady giving the two mites or however mites she gave, that's a great example of worship, right? She gave all that she had. She gave all that she had. Awesome. Well, let's look at another one. Um, let's see. In Psalm, I want to make sure I'm on the same one as it's on the board here. Um, and as we do this, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of inductive. So this is the part where we're going to have you guys look. Now, I did underline just to kind of help us along a little bit, okay? Because some of the passages are a little bit longer, and in the short time that we have, seven minutes, uh, <laughs> we need to kind of move the, this show on, on here a little bit. So so Psalm 29, 2 through 4, it says, Give unto the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, and God of, uh, God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. So here the psalmist is really pouring on this big picture of like how awesome and majestic God is. And what is his advice in terms of worship? What do you guys see there? Someone can say it out. This is kind of inductive time now, so you can talk. Give God the glory, right? Give the glory due his name. And in, in, in light of like the God of glory thunders, the Lord is over many waters. So like when I compare myself to him, like who's awesome in this picture? Is it me? No. 
Lord, you're awesome. So what does that look like when we come, maybe come into a church worship service like this or maybe in your own devotions? What's our response? God, you're awesome. You're awesome. I'm not awesome. You're awesome. All right, that's, a, that's an example. Let's look at another one. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and great King of all gods. In his name are the deep places on the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. What an awesome song, right? What are some things that stick out from there? I think I underlined some of them, but what are they? Let's say them out loud as we look at the passage. What can we learn from, from uh, the psalmist's example what should worship look like? Or how, what were some things that he did in worship? Sing. What else? Shout. Joyfully, right? Not, hey, I'm bummed. No. <laughs> Shout joyfully. Thanksgiving. Bow down. Kneel. These are things like in our, in our culture, we're very, I don't, well, maybe I'm, I'm thinking of my own Southern California culture, but we're very like hip and cool. Like, what's up? What's up, man? We're very like, I'm going to just keep my cool little image thing happening. When, when people come in contact with God, that all needs to go away, right? God isn't like, our cool bud, you know, that's like, hey, what's up, man? Are we going to go surf right now? Or, like, what are we doing? It's, it's not that. It's completely different, right? And, and he, as he's worshiping, part of, and I want to maybe have this for application for us, is when he's worshiping and singing and shouting with joy, the thoughts that are in his mind, look at what the thoughts are. He's thinking about how great God is. He's not thinking about the guitars out of tune. He's not thinking about the air conditioners too cold. He's not thinking about any of that stuff. He's not thinking, I got a bad parking spot. He's not thinking, if you're at home in your devotions, he's not thinking like, I need another cup of coffee. He's thinking, God, you made everything. You're awesome. Where his thoughts and mind are is what's fueling that worship, right? And I think for me personally, it's very easy to kind of just get my eyes down on the things of earth. And, well, you know, I don't really like this song or whatever like it can become so mundane you know and and i think i i, I, I don't know. i'm in the lobby a lot <laughs> just part of where i my, my role in the church i'm just in the lobby a lot and um because i've got stuff i'm doing in it. anyway um one of the things that that i that sometimes and i i Everybody out in the lobby, how's it going? <laughs> I, can't, I can't see you. You can see me. But like when you're in the lobby, it's really easy to get distracted. And you can even be in here and be distracted, right? But sometimes in the lobby, it's more distracting. There's people moving around. There's snacks. There's, hey, a friend just walked in. We can sit at a table together and talk. And, and all that's okay on one level. But on another level, like... God's looking for worshipers. And I got a chance. There's someone in there singing songs about Jesus. I want to be in that, <laughs> right? Now, you can be that in the lobby, too, okay? So it's not anti-lobby. I'm 
not an anti-lobbyist. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I can usually maybe catch one song that I get to sing in the lobby, as otherwise I'm, I'm cruising around trying to make sure that everyone's set and have what they need at church. That's kind of my job. But, but man, let's not get distracted and miss, like, you know what? God's awesome, and I don't want to come to church and forget that and miss that and miss the opportunity to sing with the brothers and sisters and lift up his name. Uh, another psalm, Psalm 99. Um, the Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. It's like, hey, if God's coming, the earth should just get out of the way. <laughs> Something more important than the earth is involved here, right? Let the earth be moved. Like, oh, excuse me, God. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were coming through here. Okay. Is the, what's more important, the earth or God? Well, God, sh the earth should move. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all the peoples. Let us praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You've, a, you've executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. So what are some things here? What are some things that the author does in response or in worship to the Lord? What are some things? Anybody see anything up there? Did I change the channel here? Did I get it on the right? Okay. Is that the right one? Praise, exalt. Praise, exalt. Okay, worship at his footstool. I think I put tremble. Uh, so these are all things of, again, how does, when you come to worship, when you think about that time of singing, whether it's here or in your car when you're driving or, or wherever, wherever that happens, what are your thoughts? Like, you may, you may think, um, you may even be looking around and go, man, that person just, they're just praising, like they're lifting their hands and they just seem so intent, like, how does that happen? I don't have that. What's missing? And I think what's missing is you're just not looking at God, right? You're, you're not focused on, well, who are we talking about here? And what is the invitation? God's saying, I'm looking around for people that are interested in worshiping me. So that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, to be continued, right? There's some more cool examples, so I encourage you guys to come out next week. And I, I just want to encourage us, let the, let the Lord work in our hearts so that our worship would be more real and meaningful. Not that we have to be crazy, you know, not that we have to like, well, everybody needs to dance around, or, you know, I'm not suggesting, you know, that somehow we have to... Um, act or look foolishly, but God is real, and he's inviting us to worship him, and there are good, solid reasons that we should respond in a very, uh, well, all these things, praise, exalt, all the things that we looked at, the things that the psalmist mentioned, okay? So we're going to, next week, we're going to continue along this theme of examples of what was that driving motivation and force that made them do what they did and made them think the way that they were thinking. Okay, so let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And, you know, I, I'm looking at David's life. I'm looking at these psalms that he wrote. I think it's David. Um, but the author here and his view of who, who you were and what he wanted to do because of who you were to exalt you, to to bow down, to kneel, to tremble, to sing, to shout with joy. It's, it's, it's humbling, it's convicting, it's, it's, in, it's encouraging too, it's, it's challenging. And, and the think, the invitation that we have to, 
to know you, to worship you, to, to interact with you in that way that you're interested in us. Lord, we just want to respond to your invitation. We want to respond to who you are, who you are in truth, Lord. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to get our eyes off of ourself and our surroundings. And may we put our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, may we step in more to worship. Worship of you in spirit and truth, Lord. Help us this week. Help us to grow. And so, Lord, we love you, and and we want to grow in this. We want to learn more of you about this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.